2 Samuel chapter 6. 2 Samuel 6. You may want to reach for a hymn book. You may not need to, but hymn number 136, song that I have grown up all my life singing, it is a prayer. Uh, Spirit of the living God, if you need the words, there they are. But would you just bow your heads and sing with me this prayer? Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Peace. 
Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I've been in Texas for a few days. It's very humbling to stand next to the grave of a man who was one of four who helped bring you out of your grave. And I'm grateful for the time spent there praying for my brother's family. Doug Johnson is my friend, and I know where he is, and I didn't say was. And, uh, but I was in Texas a few days, and I don't know how the Holy Spirit leads or guides, but maybe being in Texas sort of, what, sort of inspired this particular message and why it was chosen this morning. You live back out in the frontier, a dance was big doings. Now and again, folks would get together because they were just so spread out. They would join their neighbors, take a holiday. They would come from miles around, sometimes plumb over from the next county, just to spend a couple of hours celebrating the joys of life. Families dressed in Sunday go to meeting clothes, cowboys spruced up in fancy store-bought duds, homemade goodies were loaded on the buckboards, and everyone lit a trail for town. Didn't matter who you were, cattle baron, Ramrod, riding the grub line by word of mouth, everyone had an invitation to the dance. The start of 2 Samuel chapter 6, the territory of Israel was ripe for promenade. King David and his army had defeated the Philistines. The city of Jerusalem now belonged to Israel. David had plans to make Jerusalem his capital city, and part of those plans included the return of the Ark of the Covenant to its rightful place. There, beginning with verse 1 of chapter 6, it says, David again brought together out of Israel chosen men, 30,000 in all. He and all his men set out from Baalah of Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty who is enthroned between the cherubim that are on the ark. Now, the Ark of the Covenant was very precious to Israel. It was built according to the specifications the Lord had given back in the book of Exodus. The Ark was a rectangular box about four feet long and about two feet in depth, two feet wide across. It was overlaid with gold and on either end were two cherubims, two angel-like creatures. And they were on either side. They framed the space between the two of them somewhere there on the Ark of the Covenant. And that represented the mercy seat of God is where God sat in the presence of his people as the people worshiped him. There were three items contained inside the Ark of the Covenant. There was uh, the ta stone tablets that Moses brought down from top of Mount Sinai the second time. First time, remember, he broke them contained Aaron's rod, which budded in the wilderness, and it also contained a jar of manna, the food that God used to feed his children for 40 years. More than anything else, though, the Ark of the Covenant was a symbol of the presence of God <clears throat> among his people. And for over 30 years, this symbol of God's presence had been missing from the children of Israel. You see... <clears throat> Israelites one day had foolishly, foolishly used the ark as a good luck charm on the battlefield. They took on a battle that God did not intend them to fight. And as a consequence, they lost on the battlefield. And they also lost the ark of the covenant. The Philistines captured it, took it to Ashdod. They placed it inside Dagon's temple. That was one of their gods. What they were doing is saying, look, Dagon is bigger than the Lord God Almighty. And in Ashdod's temple, the first night that it was in Ashdod's mm. temple, or excuse me, Dagon's temple, Ashdod, Ashdod is the town. The first night it was there, that statue of that false god, Dagon, fell off its pedestal. Bang, hit the ground. They set it back up. The second night it fell again, as if bowing before the Lord God Almighty and broke its hands off and broke its head off. Then tumors broke out among the people of Ashdod. They said, we need to get this thing away from here. They sent it on to another town. They sent it to Gath, same results. They moved it to Edom, same results. Excuse me, Ekron, same results. And finally, after seven months, they grew so wearisome 
of the devastation caused by the Ark of the Covenant that they built a new cart for it, the Philistines did. They loaded it up and they sent it packing back to Israel. They just sent it, go, get away. And the Ark of the Covenant eventually arrived in kiriath Jerim. There it was placed under the care of the household of Abinadab. Abinadab consecrated his son, Eleazar, to guard the Ark of the Lord. And for over 30 years, the Ark of God's Covenant with his children of Israel remained out in a barn in Abinadab's place. The Israelites made no attempt to return it to Shiloh. Now, the first king of Israel came along, King Saul. He showed no interest in the abandoned ark. But when David was crowned as Israel's chosen king, and when Jerusalem belonged once again to the Israelites, David's natural inclination was to restore the Ark of the Covenant to the place of worship. And second, excuse me, 1 Chronicles 13 kind of fills us in with a few verses. It says, David, David conferred with each of his officers, the commanders of thousands and the commanders of hundreds. He then said to the whole assembly of Israel, if it seems good to you and if it is the will of the Lord our God, let us send word far and wide to the rest of our brothers throughout the territories of Israel and also to the priests and Levites who are with them in their towns and pasture lands to come and join us. Let us bring the ark of our God back to us, for we did not inquire of it during the reign of Saul. And the whole assembly agreed to do this because it seemed right to all the people of God. So David sends out an invitation to the dance, an opportunity for all to, after 30 years, dance with God. The word spread like a prairie grass fire. There's big doings in Jerusalem tonight. You can hardly imagine the preparations going on, getting ready. A parade route was marked. People donned their Sabbath best. A band was hired and began to practice. The fiddlers tuned. The callers resuscitated. The memories to forgotten worship recitations. A tent tabernacle was prepared by David to honor the abandoned ark. Lanterns were hung in the town square. The waft of fresh baked bread and fresh baked raisin cakes filled the breeze. Carpenters hammered out a new cart to, to transport the ark back home. The quartermaster issued equipment. 30, 30 excuse me, 300, said it, said it right to begin with, 30,000 soldiers. That's the same amount as was killed on the battlefield when the ark was taken. 30,000 soldiers line the streets. Horses are saddled. Chariots are hitched. David gives the orders, head them up and move them out. And off they go to the house of Abinadab, seven miles southwest from Jerusalem. For David, literally a hot hop, skip, and a jump away, as we shall see in just a moment. You could see the city of Jerusalem from Abinadab's backyard. That's how close these two towns were. Verse 3 says, They set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the ark of God on it, and Ohio was walking in front of it. Now the dance has begun. The crack of the whip over the head of the oxen has opened up the ball. They're moving toward Jerusalem, verse 5. It says, David and the whole house of Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord, with songs and with harps, lyres, tambourines, sistrums, and symbols. There was cause for celebration. There was reason for great joy. The Ark of the Covenant, the symbol of God's presence with his people was on his way, on its way to Jerusalem. The symbol of God's presence was on its way to the house of worship. How can you not sing at a moment like this? How can you keep your tongue from shouting hallelujah? This is like Easter. This is like resurrection morning. How can you keep your toe from tapping? How could you want to stifle such joy? God's the only one who could stop this kind of worship. And you know what? Before very long, they hadn't gone very far down the road when God did exactly that. God stopped their worship, brought it to a grinding halt. Verse 6 says, when they came to the threshing floor of Nakam, Nakam, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against us because of his irreverent act. Therefore, God struck him down and he died there beside the ark of God. 
And it seems like such an insignificant sin to us. I mean, all Uzzah was trying to do was to keep the Ark of the Covenant from falling off the cart. Maybe it was an e even a knee-jerk reaction. You see something falling, you go to grab it. At the surface, the outcome seems terribly unfair. Uzzah tries to catch the Ark. God strikes him dead on the spot. Man trying to lend a helping hand, and now that man is dead. And as I said, the dance grinds to a halt. It says, then David, verse 8, was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah. And to this day, that place is called Perez Uzzah. David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, how can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? He was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. David calls off the dance. Take down the lanterns, put away the fiddles, put the raisin cakes in Tupperware, exchange your broomstick skirt for, ash, for, for sackcloth, tear up your dance cards, park the ark in Obed-Edom out in his shed. The dance is canceled until we find out what happened. Why did Uzzah die? The only portion of the divine coroner's report, report that we are allowed to read in scripture says that he died because of his irreverent act. Closer examination reveals that Uzzah died of presumption. A lot of people back in the old West died of consumption. Well, Uzzah died of presumption. First, after an invitation to a dance is extended, we discover that some people, when the invitation is given some people will be struck with the presumption of the over familiar <laughs> let me think about it just for a few moments for 30 years the symbol of the presence of jehovah had remained camped out in abinadab's barn for 30 years abinadab and his sons looked after the most sacred of worship furniture as it was one of those sons he grew up with this ark out in the barn Surely it had been a blessing to their family, just as it was now to Obed-Edom. I think their barn became a shrine. I can only imagine curiosity seekers stopping by and saying, hey, can, can, we, can we see the ark? Perhaps through the years, a bit of pride built up through Abinadab's clan. Probably they, probably they began to fill themselves with self-importance. They began to consider themselves the caretakers of God. As was so often the case, and still is, God's identity became confused with the symbol of his identity. As ironic as this may sound, you may confuse this right here with Almighty God. This is not to be worshipped. God is to be worshipped. God gave us this. These are his words. Yes, this is reverent, but don't confuse it. It draws us to the living word that John 1 talk tells us about. When David issued an invitation to a dance, Uzzah and Ahio naturally assumed that they were needed to escort God and Box on the way back to the holy city. They assumed the role of trail guides. We're going to help make this dance possible. We're going to look after God like we've done these last three decades. We know more about the Ark of the Covenant than anybody else. We are the experts. We own the museum. We have cared more about this ark through the years than anybody. We're the only ones in Judea who have been tight with God these past few years. And if this job is ever going to get done, we're going to have to do it ourselves. <laughs> Off they go with their most prized possession. And when the ox stumbled and the cart shifted, us as the caretaker attempted to take care of God. And the next thing you know, the caretaker needs an undertaker. And so it goes with everyone who presumes to take care of God. To pre who presumes to take care of the Lord's business. You need to understand, we don't take care of God. God takes care of us. We don't defend God's word. God's word defends itself. God takes care of us. He looks after all of us. 
Uzzah had grown so over familiar with the presence of God at his house that he had no regard for the sanctity of the ark. The symbol of God's presence was always with him, yet the reality of God's presence was somehow lost to him. Somewhere along the way, Uzzah lost the sense of awe. Ninety days go by <clears throat> as David ponders the implications of Uzzah's death. During that time, David did some Bible study, and he had an aha moment. Uzzah had committed the sin of overfamiliar presumption. David discovers that he had committed the sin of underinformed neglect. For according to the law of Moses, God had established specific guidelines regarding ark transportation. Numbers 4.15, it says, After Aaron and his sons have finished covering the holy furnishings and all the holy articles, and when the camp is ready to move, the Kohathites are to come to do the carrying. But they must not touch the holy things or they will die. The Kohathites are to carry those things that are in, that are in the tent of meeting. Number 7.9 elaborates a little further how they were to carry these holy things. The ark was constructed with <clears throat> rings on its four corners. Staves were placed through those rings and then lifted on the shoulders of a specific family of Levites. The ark should not have been on the ark, uh, the ox cart. And if it had been where it should have been, there would have been no opportunity for us to commit an irreverent Verse 12 says, Now King David was told, The Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God. Again, the ark was blessing that family who for 90 days, three months, had cared for the ark. David now understands where he went wrong. He hears three months' worth of glorious testimony from the household of Obed-Edom. The votes are tabulated and the verdict is clear. God is not opposed to the dance, David. God honors the dance as long as the dance is in step with the beat of God's word. So again, the invitation to, 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 the, to the dance is given. The parade is charted, dance duds are donned, bows are resined, the tent of tabernacle is pitched, lanterns are hung, fresh bread is baked, soldiers stand at attention, horses are saddled, David steps in the stirrups and heads toward Obed-Edom to get the ark. Letter part of verse 12. So David went down and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, David sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. He got six steps out of the barn. Barely got out of the barn. David was like, I'm not going to make, second, to make, the, to make the same mistake twice. Right there, David offers up a sacrifice. Worship was ignited at that point. The dance has begun. As in Uzzah, we saw the presumption of the overfamiliar. Now we see in David the abandonment of the overwhelmed. The abandonment of the overwhelmed. They lit that sacrifice. After that sacrifice, they moved those seven miles toward Jerusalem, there in verse 14. So, so David, wearing a linen ephod, danced before the Lord with all his might, while he and his entire house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. David danced before the Lord with all his might. Might. This was no timid, ah, shucks, shuffling of the feet. This was no being reticent, waiting for the lights to dim and other couples to get out on the dance floor before I step out there and try to dance. This was throwing open the stall door of David's heart and letting the horses of his love for God run free. This was reckless abandonment of self to the overwhelming, all-encompassing presence of Jehovah God, Lord of creation and earth. An unreserved, 
David dance the Judean jitterbug with all of his might. Why not? He was in love with God. And he didn't care what anyone else thought about that. Why not? God had been abandoned all these years. Now he and he alone, God and God alone, deserves center stage. And as David conceded the dance floor to God, he relinquished all abandonment to God and took it upon himself. That's what worship really is. That's what worship ought to be. Total, reckless abandonment of self. Losing oneself in the loving, grace-soaked arms of God who leads us in this dance called life. Eugene Peterson in his book, Leap Over a Wall, says David danced in God. David has access to life that exceeded his capacity to measure or control. He was on the edge of mystery, of glory, and so he danced. Walking is our normal mode of locomotion, but when we're beside ourselves with love, charged with excess of meaning, shaken out of preoccupation with ourselves, we dance, don't you? <laughs> nah, come on. Some of you are just dancing around your house when you think no one else is looking, right? Worship is the strategy by which we interrupt our preoccupation with our puny little selves and attend to the presence of God. David was caught up in the dance because David was caught up in the relationship. Little wonder that God spoke well of David by saying, there's a man whose heart beats in sync with mine. David was doing the boot scoot boogie to the glory of God. And I'll just tell you, I'd rather do the boot scoot boogie. David's boot scoot, scoot boogie in jubilee over Jesus' relationship with me than Uzzah's boot hill shuffle of religion any day of the week. Well, when you're invited to the dance, there will always be the presumption of the over-familiar. And I pray to God, there will be someone who takes up the spirit and they represent the abandonment of the overwhelmed, being overwhelmed by the presence of God. But there's one other possible person who could show up at the dance that we see here, and they represent the contempt of the onlooker. Someone on the outside looking in. They don't have to be on the outside. They've just chosen to be on the outside. Verse 16. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michal, Queen Michal, David's wife Michal, daughter of Saul, watched David from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. The storm, storm clouds are gathering and they're threatening to rain on David's parade again. Queen Michal looks down upon the procession. And when she sees her husband hip-hopping among the common people, she turns red bandana red. What is he doing down there? How could he behave this way? Has he lost his dignity? Doesn't he know he is embarrassing me? He, he, he is stripped down to the clothing of his subjects. He's a king. How low can you go? What is he doing down there? You know, you cannot help but want to flip the question back up to her. What are you doing up there? <laughs> There's a dance down here. What are you doing up there? You're worse than a wallflower. You're a window flower. You're missing out, girl. Why are you so afraid of what others might think? So afraid that you're unwilling to step near the dance floor of God and trip the light fantastic. Michael reminds me of the crowd that gathered around Jesus in John 12, 42 and 43. It says this about them. It says, yet at the same time, many even among the leaders believed in Jesus 
But because of the Pharisees, they would not confess their faith for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved praise from men more than praise from God. Verse 17, they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship of fellowship offerings before the Lord. After he had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. Then he gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins to each person in the whole crowd of Israelites. Homemade, homemade little Debbies, okay? A uh, whole crowd of Israelites, both men and women, and all the people went to their homes. Verse 20, when David returned home to Bless his household, Michal, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, How the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, disrobing in the sight of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. Whew. As soon as David steps through the door, Michal attempts to pour water on holy fire. So it goes with those on the outside of relationship looking in. Those who hold invitations to the dance, who for whatever reason consider the dance foolish or miss the point of the dance. Those outside of the dance with Christ are often scornful of the dance. There's a warning for those who have succumbed to the reckless abandonment of faith Perhaps the number one reason why so many Christians refuse to dance, to choose to sit it out. Here's the warning. When you're really free, the people who are not so free will have trouble with you being free. Those who are deaf always despise those who dance. Those who cannot hear the music Always consider the dancers mad. An invitation to the dance. Uzzah missed it because he thought he needed to take care of God. Lest he break a hip on the dance floor, the poor old man. <laughs> Mikkel missed it because she didn't care to. But David enjoyed a heavenly hoedown, hoedown because he cast his eyes upon the Lord. Verse 21. It's a sad verse. The implications in this are very sad. He says, David said to Michal, it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people, Israel. Pride's entering into David's heart right here. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this. And I will be humiliated in my own eyes, but by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. Now, my heart is in line with David when he says, I will be more undignified than this. If you think I, I was undignified then, I'm just getting started. But I see a shift in David's attitude right here that's concerning to me. David reminded Michal, I wasn't dancing with you or for you. I was dancing before the Lord. But it seems there's no humility as David says this. I'll tell you why I know that. Because verse 23 says, And Michal, David's wife, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. She still lived in the palace, but David was done with her. There was a crack in their relationship that did not get mended. And if you just go over four chapters, chapter 11, that's when David strolled up to the top of the palace and saw Bathsheba taking a bath. And a seed of it was planted right here, maybe even before here. I'll read this now, and I'm like, David, David, what you should have done is said, to, please pray with me. Michael, it's you and I pray. It's you and I come and hit our knees before Almighty God. Pray with me. That, that, that should have been David's response. 
And I agree. Revised Standard Version, when he says, I will make Mary before the Lord, I understand that. I agree. I will take, make myself more contemptible than this. I understand that. I will, be, I, will, I will be humiliated in my own eyes. Meek, meek will nothing come second to the Lord. No amount of criticism is going to rob me of the joy I found in him today. I will dance because I'm called to dance. I understand that. Right attitude. But maybe with a little twinge of harshness because it, was, it drove a wedge in their home. Everyone had received invitations to the dance, but only one of them danced. Which one are you? Are you stifling a, law, uh, stifling a yawn on the road in New Jerusalem beside the presence of God because God and his son had become so boring? You become so over familiar with God, you're over familiar with Jesus, or are you standing in the window, overlooking the proceedings, torn between God's ways, his foolishness, and yet longing to lose yourself in complete surrender to God? Or are you caught up in the wonder of grace like David was, swept off your feet by the worship of your heart, lost in obedient sashaying to the will of God? So captivated by the Lord Jesus Christ that you know not where the song of worship ends and the song of obedient living begins. Rich Mullins wrote a song called Promenade. Words go like this. When the dancers took to the promenade, well, my heart leapt high and I was unafraid of the feeling I'd stifled for so many years. Tell me, how do you, how do you feel? When the band took their places and got all in tune, then the caller's voice well, it rang out beneath the moon. And then the boys took their girls and they started to reel. And they were singing, how do you, how do you feel? And then the people in the town said, they'd call the police if we didn't keep down all this disturbing their peace. And Officer Black, you know, he answered their pleas and he ran up the hill just to see. Well, he hid in the bushes just a stone's throw away and then he saw this change come over their face and he was bouncing to the beat, the policeman was. He started hopping on his heels, singing, how do you, how do you feel? He got caught up in the dance. The policeman who was sent to shush it, to put, it, put an end to it, says, and then the townspeople ask him if he'd make some arrest. Could they find peace and quiet so they could go back to bed? The officer said, if it's peace that you want, you're going to find it on the hill, the hill. But the silence that you keep is the silence that kills. So the townspeople all got so uptight and mad, you know, they fired him on the spot and then they threw away his badge. Then they asked him to leave and he said, gladly I will. And they said, tell us now how you feel. <laughs> he said, when the dancers took to the promenade, when my heart leapt high and I was unafraid of the feeling I'd stifled for so many years. Tell me, how do you, how do you feel? Let's pray. An invitation to God's dance is extended to all. It is etched in blood upon a tablet of wood. To every other here this morning, God invites, let me lead. To every meekle, God invites, take the leap of faith from the window of reluctance to the dance floor with Christ. And to every David, God declares, keep on dancing. But also keep your humility in check. Father, you're speaking. I believe that. You know where we are in this dance may we respond to your invitation now in your name i pray Stand, sing 176. <clears throat>